We are a community witness um, working with uh, for Capstone Computer Science Spring Summer 2021. Um, community witness is an application that's designed to be a neighborhood watch app where people who see things can report it, um, not necessarily to the police. Now we're going to head over to the demo. Well, I'm Hadia, and I will be doing a demo of the web app. So as an investigator, you can you have to rather log in. And this will lead you to your dashboard where you can view information about yourself as an investigator and view the cases that you've picked up. Now, suppose I want to search for a case relating to a car. Um, I can search by place, date, start time, and end time. And so suppose I want to start at 10 o'clock and the end time, two o'clock. Uh, the list of cases that match that criteria will come up and you can click on this, this folder icon. It will bring up all the details. And if you're interested, you can pick it up and it will show it as my case. And if you go to home, it will be added to your list of cases. Now you can also chat or send um, a chat message to the witnesses and only for the reports that you have picked up. And it will go through to the phone app. And that concludes the web app demo. Hello, my name is Tayshawn, and I'll be going over the mobile app with you guys. So here in the first page, this is the initial uh, ad report that gets opened up when you open our app. And you can type in what happened, um, where it happened here, and then you can also import your location if needed, if you didn't know your current address. And then as we come to the next part of the section, you import your time. And as you notice, it will do the default time that is current. And then it also gets the current date as well. But if this is maybe an event that maybe happened yesterday or so, you can also change that if you want it to. And then lastly, you can take a picture of whatever is happening. Right now, our camera is glitched because of uh, the recording software. But here you can snap a picture and it'll get whatever you take a picture of. And then you add that. And then it'll appear right here. And you're able to add three pictures per case. And then here's our submit button when you're done with that uh, piece of evidence. And then next, you go over to our inbox page. You'll notice that this is a list of all the investigators that are potentially messaging you. And if you click on one of these, it'll open up a chat fragment where you can type and uh, talk to the investigator. And then click send. And you'll notice that that message gets sent to him. And then you can always um, take this further to like your cell phone if you didn't want to message an app and exchange info there. And then to go back to our page, our last page is our person person fragment. And this is where all your cases are listed. So like you examined a car crash or whatever else happened. And you can search, you can search through all your cases. If you have more than two, you can search by the name of that title. So it'd be car crash and that'll appear or the second mobile option, which is this. And then lastly, to view the details of whatever event happened, you just click on that and it'll show you the images that you might have posted and then all the details and whatnot. And that's our mobile. Um, there are going to be two roles in our application. Witnesses are going to be the folks reporting. Um, investigators are going to be, you know, the media, but uh, the media and possibly but not necessarily law enforcement officials. Um, our target audience is going to be the people who would use this app. So it's going to be everyday citizens, hence the neighborhood watch nature of it. Um, journalists, the media in general, um, and again, possibly but not necessarily police. So our app is going to be threefold. Um, there's a, a mobile app for witnesses, a database, and then a web app for investigators. Um, main features of our app, mobile app is going to be able to record evidence and upload that to the database. Um, the web application is going to be able to search the database for the uploaded data. Um, communication to witnesses is going to be one way. Um, investigators will have to initiate that um, communication, and then witnesses can talk back if they want to. Um, and this is because witnesses remain anonymous. That's one of our, our core values. Um, and then nobody can remove anything from our, from our database. Um, so again, to help with privacy. Um, so the mobile app can upload evidence. Um, it can add basically date, time, location, data, descriptions, um, and photos of the events. Um, photos will be stored locally. And then the, uh, there's a feature that will allow you to generate the location um, automatically. Um, so if you're in a stressful situation, you don't necessarily have to um, know exactly where you are, the street names or anything. Um, once data has been loaded to the database, um, this is then available for qualified investigators. Um, again, media or possibly not 
necessarily police. Um, and they can search the, the database by, again, by the same type of field, state, time, and location. Um, date ranges and location ranges are also, or excuse me, date ranges and time ranges are also acceptable. And then location range would be a goal for down the road. Uh, investigators can message witnesses. Um, again, like I said, that's going to be pretty much a one-way street. Um, after the conversation is initiated, the witness can decide to respond if they feel like they can trust the investigator. Um, witnesses will always remain anonymous. Um, there's no personal data stored in our application for witnesses, um, not even their names, emails, anything like that. Um, and information in the database is totally um, permanent. Um, that's, again, that's for the scale of our project at the moment, if that makes sense. Um, down the line, we may have to revisit that, um, but nobody can delete anything you can only add. And as I kind of went over at the beginning, our, this is our basic uh, architecture for our project. We have a, a web application and a mobile app, both of them talk to an API, which is going to be over the top of our, our actual database. This is Hadia, and I will be going over the details of the web app. And so start out by going over the development process. You started out by researching available technologies that could be used to create the front end. After discussing what was available um, and taking the team's strengths into consideration, we decided to go with React uh, as our JavaScript framework. A node for the backend, Bootstrap for CSS, and Cypress for testing. The initial development for the web app included creating skeleton components and pages, and then incrementally developing uh, the components and adding the logic that will power the functionalities of our app. Since the REST API was being developed in parallel to the web app, information that would come from the database was simulated um, while the API was being constructed. Uh, towards the middle to, middle to end of the development process, the API was complete and it could be integrated into the code and replace the dummy data. It was also around this time we created a server uh, for the node backend to facilitate the communication between a witness and investigator. And we used socket.io and Express to send information back and forth between the node server, the web app, and the mobile app. So I was responsible for creating the React components for the web app, uh, designing the user interfaces, implementing the logic uh, for search and several other components and testing the overall functionality of the app. Hey, this is Charlie. Mm -hmm. So my responsibilities for this project are on the web app side, I was responsible for creating the framework for the web app. And I was also responsible for making sure that the web app has the proper licenses to make sure it can be able to run properly. And now I'll pass things off to Benjamin to discuss things further. Alrighty. Hey, y'all. Um, my name is Ben. I was responsible for working with the web socket chat that we implemented for communication between witnesses and investigators. Um, so that basically entailed um, connecting the web app to the node server um, and then a little bit of UI work for the chat UI. Um, we're going to pass things back to Jonathan to talk about the uh, component hierarchy. Okay. So this is the hierarchy of how the web app looks. So the app is the top of the chain, and it's broken up into five different categories of the home, the search, the chat, the login, and the navigation. Okay. The search allows you to get details from the more detail from the search. Then the login stub allows you to create an account. And from the home, you can get details in relation to the cases. And you can also resolve any cases that are currently active. Now, now I'll kick things off the bench and to talk about the mobile app. Ready. So I was responsible for developing the mobile app along with Bailey, Tayshawn, and Zane. Um, so a little bit about our development process. Um, this was one of the last components to kind of get off the ground. Um, uh, in our development process, we kind of had the, the back end kind of went full steam ahead and then the, the web app, and we were kind of one of the last ones, um, mostly because none of us had ever built any type of mobile app before. Um, so we were, there was, there was a, a steep learning curve to, to figuring out what we were doing. Um, so basically, we divided up into the, the three teams I just mentioned. Um, and our first ask was to research, okay, how do, how do we build a mobile app? What does that look like? Um, we ended up settling on Android and specifically Android's version of Java, so the Java version of Android library. Um, so we're all relatively familiar with Java. Um, and then we started dividing up tasks. Um, so we used a, a Kanban board um, to get cracking. Um, and we just divided tasks up pretty much based on people's life workload. Um, so people who are 
kind of crazy, kind of had hectic schedules, you know, they would get a lighter task versus people who were, you know, this was their only class or this was, you know, one of the main things going on in life, they would get a larger task. Um, so we kind of divided things up that way. Um, and basically, we just had to teach ourselves very quickly. Um, there, that's kind of the, the conclusion when there are no experts in your in your group, um, you just have to have to learn very quickly. Um, and I think we did a good job of that. Um, we, by the end, I'd say we were, we were definitely into a groove where you'd really, um, you kind of, we kind of talk on, on Thursday, you know, we kind of add new cards to the Kanban board, get those assigned out, you know, and by Tuesday, we'd come around and we meet again in our stand up and be like, okay, is this done? Is this working? Um, are we blocked? Like what needs, what needs to happen? Um, and where do we go from here? So that was, that was pretty much the, uh, the development process for us. Um, now we're going to talk a little bit about the different components that each member worked on. Um, so I'm going to kick it over to me again. Um, so I'm, I was responsible for, as you saw in our demo, the, uh, the person page. Um, so that's the page with the, with the search bar on the top um, and then the list of cases. Um, I also worked on developing the anonymous username. Um, so that is generated on app download. Um, it's local to the app. Um, it's unique to the app. Um, and then I also worked with um, connecting the WebSocket chat from the app side. So I worked on the, uh, on the web application and then the mobile app also getting them to talk, to we get, talk together and talk to the node server. Um, and then to do that, I ended up delving into Android notifications and Android, um, even creating a, an app service to, to keep the socket open, um, which is probably not the most efficient way to do it, but uh, so we could come up with in 12 weeks. So I'm going to kick it over to Tayshawn now. Hey guys, my name is Tayshawn. And for the mobile app, I worked on basically getting like our foundation going of our user interface for the mobile app and how that was going to look. And then I also helped out in our color scheme and make sure everything looked um, good to our sponsor standards. And then I worked on our inbox uh, user interfaces. Uh, user interfaces. And I'll pass it off to Bailey to talk about what he worked on. Hey guys, this is Bailey. Um, I was responsible for the ad report page in the app. Um, uh, the page in the app that allowed everybody to put in the details of an event that happened and uh, send that up to the database. I also added functionality for the camera app that will use uh, the built-in camera app on whatever device you're using. I'm going to pass it off to Zane. This is Zane. I did uh, some of the more minor uh, tweaks and uh, small things around the mobile app. Uh, probably the biggest thing that I did was working on the retrofit communications with the database server. Uh, but I also did things like uh, set up uh, the unit testing and writing some of the documentation. My name is Kyle Zalewski, and I'm here to talk about the back end. So for hardware, uh, which was one of the first decisions we had to make, we decided to use the Google Cloud platform uh, and run small Linux boxes for the database, website, API, and node server. Uh, the API and database were both handled on one VM. We had Postgres and then an API framework that Eric will talk about in a little bit. Uh, that was on a single machine. And then the node server and web server both had uh, just those singular purposes. Uh, so it allowed us to keep um, keep things kind of atomic so that if something breaks, we don't have to take down the whole system. Uh, and it also kept the the responsibility for each server so low that they were very, very cheap and expensive machines to run. Uh, and so the nice thing about one of the nice things about Google Platform, uh, in addition to being familiar, is that it allows scalability. So if you happen to just have a sudden surge in user base, you can pretty easily scale up uh, the VMs that you're using for your services. Uh, we also ran into an issue of dynamic IP addresses. So in the cloud platform, whenever a machine goes down, uh, it's more than likely to come back up with a different IP address, a different uh, external IP address. So what we did was we acquired a free uh, DNS name that corresponds to each of our physical servers, quote unquote, physical VMs, and then set up a client uh, on each of the servers that dynamically updates those records uh, if the IP changes. So that way we don't have pieces of code that are pointing at specific IP addresses that then change and then it breaks a whole bunch of stuff downstream. Uh, we can just reach it by host name. And so our general development process, uh, the first, very first thing we had to do was determine what hardware uh, to use. And so that was kind of the, you know, before any actual code could be written, that was the, the first thing that needed to happen. And then uh, we got connected to a GitHub repository that we set up so that when we make changes, uh, we can easily pull them down uh, and also have some history in case something breaks. Uh, there was also a small update script that ended up getting ported over to the web server as well that basically pulls everything down from Git, restarts the service, and you can just rapidly deploy stuff um, without having to think too much. And uh, so the actual development process, uh, you know, in terms of writing features was driven by the needs of the front end. So we have a set of wish list items for API endpoints that corresponded to use cases. Uh, and then as the front end did their development uh, and they would become blocked by the lack of some feature, uh, we would prioritize that, create a card, and uh, the person who 
uh, felt that they were the most familiar with that part of the code base that the, the card concerned uh, would pick that up. And so they would check out a new branch specifically for that feature. And then once it was complete, push that to a remote and open a pull request. Uh, so the backend team was just me and Aoric. And at first we were finding that we needed uh, PR approvals from people who really weren't familiar with the backend at all. And so we changed it so that either of us could approve the other's PR and then um, that would be sufficient to merge. Uh, and then eventually we got to the point where we were just approving and merging each other's PRs to save time because it seems kind of silly to ask for an approval, get an approval, and then have to get back onto GitHub to merge it yourself. And so then if a person merges a feature that they want to implement right away, you can just SSH into the server, run that update script, and then it would be immediately effective. And now I'm going to hand it back to Elric, and he's going to talk about some of the API technologies we leveraged. Hi, I'm Elric, and I'm going to be talking about the uh, technologies we used for the API. So uh, the API is a, a RESTful API, and we used the uh, Eclipse's Jersey REST framework for Java um, because we wanted to write in Java so that we could match the mobile app also being in Java so that we could use the same language in the project as much as, much as possible. And uh, Jersey implements the uh, Java for REST web services or JAX-RS, which is uh, what most of the development was powered by, which provides annotations for marking methods as uh, web endpoints where you can do HTTP requests against those methods. Um, we also use the Eclipse Grizzly HTTP server framework, which allowed us to embed an HTTP server in the API so that the API can be packaged as a runnable JAR file. Um, we use the Jargon2 Java API for Argon2 for password hashing to make sure that passwords are stored securely and not as plain text. We use the uh, Gradle build tool for building the project, uh, JUnit for unit testing, and the uh, Locust load testing tool for stress testing the API, which is a uh, RESTful API stress testing tool. And for the uh, database schema, we have an image here. And uh, as you can see, the, uh, the, the main focus of the schema was the reports that witnesses can file. And uh, kind of branching out from that, we have the data about individual investigators and witnesses. And, uh, and like chat messages and accompanying data needed to support the, the API's functionality. But uh, the main focus is that you have reports and uh, witnesses can file from zero to as many reports as they want and investigators can investigate uh, from zero to as many reports as they want. And a report can be investigated by as many investigators as are interested. And uh, for my responsibilities and contributions, I worked on the API endpoint design and implementation, the documentation for that. Um, I worked on the authentication authorization, like a login, password, stuff like that. I worked on the uh, build system, getting it to build and install automatically through Gradle. I worked on the stress tests against the API and some uh, common classes for both the API and the mobile app to be able to use, as well as a uh, helped with the uh, schema design. And now back to Kyle. All right, so some of my responsibilities were uh, the specking, deployment, and maintenance of the VMs that we use for our services, uh, as well as documenting uh, setups for those. So we have, a, we have some documents that show how to connect, uh, they have various credentials, what services they use, uh, how to find something that uh, you may not otherwise be able to find. Uh, helpful for moving this project into somebody else's hands. Uh, I was also part of the initial database schema design, as well as uh, how that updated as the project went along, because it evolved uh, drastically from our initial cut. Um, the update scripts, as I mentioned before, uh, dynamic IP handling as well. Uh, API endpoint implementation and testing uh, was uh, a main contribution. I added unit tests for uh, the not only the API endpoints themselves, but also the backend uh, classes and methods that they used, uh, as well as documenting testing and uh, working API endpoints uh, for use by other members of the team. So here we have some of the unexpected events we experienced. Um, we're just going to kind of do like a, a popcorn style. Um, everybody kind of put down unexpected events that they experienced. So I'm going to pass it off to Kyle here first to tell you a little bit about that. 
Yeah, so one unexpected event for me was that the node server would just inexplicably stop running. Uh, it would become completely unresponsive, wouldn't be able to SSH into it or anything, uh, even after a hard reset. And so once I got that uh, resolved, at least temporarily, I decided to image not only that, but all of the servers so that if it happened again, we could get them spun back up without too much of an interruption in service. Uh, and then it never happened again. So at least we have backups, though. <laughs> uh, back to Ben. All right. So a couple of errors that uh, I ran into pretty much solely related to WebSockets. Um, it turns out that uh, Android virtual machines um, have their own IP address. Um, so connecting WebSockets to the correct IP address, especially when running locally. So you have your, your local host address, and then Android VM has its own IP address. So figuring out how to get those two to mesh together um, took a lot of work. Um, but it just came back to come back to the documentation, um, lots of hours of research, and it, uh, it works now. So not much else to be said about that. Um, and as if that wasn't fun enough, um, turns out connecting WebSockets to the React app also um, wasn't, the, wasn't the easiest. Um, the error turned out to be basically using the, the local host host name instead of the local host um, IP address. Um, and then I also had to specify the transport type as WebSockets as opposed to, I think, normally just polling or something like that. Um, so that's that's kind of the two uh, unexpected events I ran into. As different parts of the project came together, it became apparent that there were some roles that were neither part of the investigator side or the witness side. And this, we decided that this would be a third perspective on this app, uh, an administrator. So the sale work again, and one thing I encountered was uh, with the Jersey framework, um, when the, when uncaught exception happens in your code, um, Jersey will return a HCB 500 error code to the client. Um, instead of like in a more basic job app where it just crashes and prints the exception details and trace. Um, so, I mean, it's good for reliability that doesn't crash, but it makes it a bit harder to track down the source of those errors. Kyle again, uh, gonna talk about some lessons we learned. So for me, uh, at least using the refactor feature in IntelliJ saved me a bunch of time when I was uh, say having to change a data type or something like that. I know at one point we changed uh, the type of uh, a column in Postgres representing an evidence piece, uh, which required me to then go back upstream and change the data types for all of our classes and API endpoint that uh, was responsible for writing to that table. Uh, and that was a task that could have taken a very long time, but ended up taking about 15 minutes because of that refactor feature. Uh, and then also just spending the time to fully flesh out ideas in front of the team uh, when it comes to things that affect the whole team, like data models uh, that proved very effective um, in terms of only having to change something once uh, as opposed to, you know, kind of seeing what sticks and then finding out later it's totally incompatible with what the front end was doing or something like that. Uh, Elric, again, a lesson I learned is that uh, a REST API is not just like a thin wrapper around a database, but uh, it really is like its own program that you need to, you know, design the endpoints and all, all that stuff to make sure it Work smoothly. Okay, this is Jonathan, and one of the things I found is that when trying to connect things together, it's often kind of useful to make sure you like, talk with either the back end or the mobile independent way trying to get connected together. Then again, um, I found one thing that I learned um, is that mobile app development is uh, it's pretty complicated, um, and there's there is a, you can do a lot of things with mobile apps. So narrowing that down to useful components that are um, necessary for your app to get it to do what you want it to um, is definitely it's definitely a process and you definitely have to think outside the box if you want that to succeed. Um, so this is Javier. I learned that continuous, continuous and frequent feedback is key to developing a good application. And I'm not just talking about um, the web app I was working on, just any application. I received lots of good advice, not just from our sponsor, um, but also from the rest of my teammates. And that really helped me develop the UI for the web app. So now we're going to talk a little bit about customer feedback. Um, so our sponsor, um, Bruce Irvin, was the uh, the same individual who was our capstone professor as well. Um, we met with him a total of seven times during the spring and summer. Um, and each meeting, he had a lot of constructive criticism for us. Um, he kind of helped us narrow our vision of what the app looked like in his bit to his vision of what the app looked like. Um, I think in most cases, our version was more complicated than what he needed. I think some of his key principles would be keeping the app really simple and obviously really safe, really anonymous. Um, those would be some things that he really helped us adhere to, and I think are present in the uh, the mobile app um, and the web app today. Um, so big big thanks to him. Um, he would also be the sole person for us to, to acknowledge here um, and say a big thank you. Um, I think he did a, an awesome job of being a sponsor, um, and he really 
I really hope that we uh, brought his vision to life in a way that he would, he would be proud of. Um, so with that said, that's really all we have here for Community Witness. Um, thank you all for watching and have a great rest of your day.